Hello everybody. Welcome to this webinar brought to you by Kenanga Investment Bank and managed by Wellford International, Sanjay Bahad. So we are very excited to be hosting you today for this webinar, which is titled Live Chat with Pastec International Bahad, Technology to Keep the Lights On. Today, we are very excited because we have invited the Managing Director come Group CEO, Mr. Paul Lim, to join our live chat session on this Zoom webinar. So how is everybody doing? Are you doing great? Okay, before we begin, can you please kindly tell us like where you are tuning from? Are you from like KL, Penang, JB, Kuantan, Sabah, Sarawak? Okay, please type in the chat box to tell us like where are you tuning in from? Yes, good evening, everybody. Oh, yes, we have our friends here from JB, Penang, KL, Para, Selangor, PJ, Kuching, Sarawak, Malacca, Shah Alam, literally everywhere from Malaysia. Okay, Kelantan, Terengadu. All right, cool. Thanks, everybody, for letting us know about yourself. So we even have shareholders tuning in to this webinar. Wow. All right. So it looks like everybody, a lot of people are in now. We have a few hundred people on the line right now. And this session is also simultaneously cast on uh, YouTube, our YouTube channel. So thanks everybody for spending your precious uh, evening to join this uh, session. I know your time is very precious. So uh, we will make it we will make it the best session for you to understand about Pestec International. Uh, Pestec International is actually a power infrastructure technology player listed on Bursa Malaysia since 2012. So by joining this session, you will gain insight into this company, uh, understand the business performance, particularly in the uh, first half of financial year 2021, and also understand their, what uh, the future prospect, what does the future hold for them. So this year we see that uh, Pestec International's uh, share price has been on the uptrend. So uh, today we have invited the, the CEO, group CEO to come to this uh, session so you can ask him any pertinent question that you want to know about Pestec. All right, so before we begin, just want to go through the disclaimer. So whatever we share on this webinar is only for educational purpose. So in no way that we give any recommendation to buy or sell any company. So you, if you decide to make any investment decision after this webinar, you do it at your own risk. All right. So uh, without further ado, let me just invite and hand over the session to Mr. Paul to share with you about Pastec Internationals, their company's background, uh, the business performance for first half financial year 2021, as well as the futures prospect. Okay, over to you, Mr. Paul. Thank you, Shen. So let me try to share uh, my screen. Uh, I cannot start sharing my screen. Uh, it says here, uh, Shen. Oh, you may. I stopped sharing already. Oh, okay, now, huh? all right. All right, yes. uh, I hope everybody can see it. Yeah, okay, so this is about Pestec International, a uh, company that I've associated with since the year 2000. So, uh, while well, we have a little bit of our own uh, disclaimer, wait, hang on. Okay, our own disclaimer or some of the statement that I make may be forward looking. So uh, you're making a decision on your own uh, after you're listening to me. That's what like Sean, Shen was saying. So, okay, so let's start by uh, sharing a bit of information about Pestec. So uh, the company is actually uh, been around since 1991. Before we got listed, we are called Pestec Sandyam Bahad. But as of today, we have exported to a region of around 20 countries, uh, of course, focusing in Southeast Asia region. And uh, at this moment, uh, our various offices has got 698 employees. Major offices is, of course, Malaysia, Cambodia, Philippines, and uh, China. So what exactly do we do? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we call ourselves... Uh, 
we call ourselves, hang on, call ourselves the builders of electrical infrastructures for power grid and transportation systems. So uh, what it means by that is um, we have divisions that is doing the electrical substation. We build the backbone of the transmission network in our uh, utilities all over the region in Malaysia, of course, and uh, Pap Papua New Guinea, Cambodia, Philippines, Laos. We have done work in Western Africa. If you see the map just now, as far north, we have done work in Kazakhstan. Down south, we have gone all the way to Australia by delivering them products. But we have done substations up to, from 33 kVs to 500 kVs. Uh, these substations, we build it based on our EPCC uh, module, where we design and build from uh, works all the way to structural, and of course, equip the main, uh, most important part, the equipment in a substation. So other than substation, we also do transmission line, of course, in order to bring power safely to the consumer. Uh, and the transmission line that you see, uh, maybe along the highway, we have done from 33 kV all the way to 500 kV in the region. Uh, and also uh, underground cables, because uh, for, for city like Kuala Lumpur, you will not see transmission line. Uh, so they are all underground. So we have done 33 kV all the way to 275 kV of underground cable constructions. And um, other than transmission line, substation and all that, recently since year 2016, we have gone into real electrification. So uh, after four or five years, real electrification has actually become quite a major part of our works, uh, concentrating, of course, still in Malaysia, even though we have done work in Bangkok. But real electrification uh, has become one of our major upside of the group as potential, which I'll go through it a little bit afterwards. Okay. Power plant automation and upgrades. Uh, we have a division that is looking at power plant. So we have done quite a lot of works actually in all around Malaysia into upgrading their control system and uh, upgrades of their balance of plant and stuff like that. Uh, other than that, we also are, are doing EPC, EPC for solar farm, uh, which we are involved in a 50 megawatt plant in Bidor, Perak, connecting the AC part to the grid. But currently we are also doing one solar plant in uh, Barbet, Cambodia for 20 megawatt. So that is the power plant site. Uh, other than all the services, we have our own products, mainly executed by our division called Pestec Energy, where we do control and protection system, as well as switch gears up to 33 kV. And these switch gears are approved now in uh, Tanaga National uh, Unit, uh, dis Tanaga Distribution, Sanyam Bahad, that can be able to deliver to Tanaga uh, to, for use in their network. So we do have products of our own, that uh, we manufacture and assemble in our factory in uh, Bukit Buruntong as well as in U5 Sha'alam. So basically, as a summary, uh, this, this slide shows you what we do. Basically, it's the builder of electrical infrastructures for our grid as well as for transportation system. So opportunity is a lot around the region because we are in the region of growth of Southeast Asia, where the basic per capita energy usage per person in Southeast Asia is actually much, much uh, small compared to country like uh, America, Europe, which mean to say that urbanization and uh, modernization will continue uh, to progress where we will demand more and more power and we demand more and more uh, grid uh, facility and transportation system powering up through electric city. So with that, I hope everybody understand what we are what we are focusing on and our main business is about what activity. However, the business segment of the group, we divided into three segments. Uh, one is EPCC, which I touched on just now. All our works, we are, we are, for, we are able to do engineering, procurement, constructions, uh, cost testing and commissioning. It's a know-how that we have in our group. And the other business segment is called concession, where actually since year 2016, we have created a division of income stream uh, through a concession business where we are uh, no longer just waiting every year on EBC, but also complemented by concession income that is recurring. So with that, of course, we have done some investment, which I'll go through uh, what is the effect on our books uh, with this income stream that we have created since 2016. 
And of course, like I said, we have a products groups. So how each, div each division is doing of the last half year, if you have look at our result uh, as of the December 2020 cutoff, uh, in terms of works, uh, EPCC is 350 million. Concession income is given us 69 million ringgit and product is 7 million. So our books is, have got a turnover of 427.4 million as of half year 2020-2021. But because of concession and because of accounting standard, we also have an income that's called finance income where it is contributed about 22.5 million uh, half year of uh, year 2021. Actually, our real revenue turnover is about 449 million, uh, 450 million uh, ringgit compared to previous year, half year is 399 million. So with that, uh, of course, in the books, uh, you also know, I just had a summary here where we have actually scored better in both EBIT, EBITDA and profit after tax. But however, because we have some non-controlling interest sharing with some of our partners in our Cambodia project, uh, the owner's part uh, that is sharing the profit after tax reported is actually uh, reduced by 15% if you compare half year to half year. But interestingly, I just want to point out some of the things that you may not see is uh, our owner's part of the books are affected actually by this uh, element of unrealized forex loss in our books, where which, which we carry. This is because in our books balance sheet right now, we have about close to 50 over million US dollar asset, US dollar based asset that we are waiting to collect uh, whenever that is due from our concession business. As well, of course, because of the fluctuation of US dollar, our account has to be reporting on unrealized losses. So basically it's a paper loss as of uh, 31st December, 2020. So if you take out that one on paper loss, we are actually making an extra another 15.3 million. And all these 15.3 million is actually belong 100% to the owners of the company, which is uh, all the shareholders. If you add on to that 23 million, we are actually 38.43 million. Uh, if we take out the paper loss. So in fact, our groups is doing at a 42% increment compared to the first half year of 2020. If you compare that with the previous half year. So ladies and gentlemen, if you really look at that, the asset that we have in terms of US dollar is experiencing unrealized loss because of the currency that we have to report in, not because of the real loss. But how are we doing in terms of a real Realized Forex, is it a gain or loss? Well, over the years, I put up a figure here. Uh, we have actually experienced net uh, realized Forex gain all the time. This is mainly because all our collection of US dollar are actually timed and scheduled. So we actually really know when are we collecting all the US dollar because of all the concession uh, contract that we have achieved COD. So we are able to plan ahead uh, based on the hedging instrument that we have in the groups. So hopefully this uh, explain a little bit on our uh, reporting uh, of our account in the first half year of 2021 year, financial year 2021. So with that behind me, uh, I'd like to go a little bit on uh, tell maybe all the people what are actually Pestec doing. We are a counter in the BUSA that is unique because we are not uh, uh, what they call it, property developer, plantation, banking, which is all most of the conventional uh, stock or company and not a, not a, a GLC, of course. Our projects are, like I said, including transmission line and substation. But before I go into that, but uh, about early of the year, uh, we, when we announce a project, we also announce a cancellation of a project uh, on our Fiji project that we won. Actually, about a year ago, we received a conditional award. But during a year of this negotiation of when we will finish the job and we meet up with uh, our friend COVID-19, uh, which we are not able to come to a concession between the client and us into finalizing an acceptable contract uh, forward-looking risk management 
So both parties decided to mutually amicably terminate the project first. So basically it's like, I like you very much. I want you to do the job, but sorry, uh, maybe it's best for both parties not to proceed because of the COVID uncertainties. So we have decided to accept that and also the client are happily terminating it so that there's no risk if we go ahead with the execution of the project. So that's why the reason when we announced also the cancellation of Fiji project, hopefully that clear a little bit of uh, understanding what is the background of the bad news that we announced other than all the good news. So with that behind me, uh, actually we like to highlight here is uh, Pestec also, we are supplying smart meters into TMB. Uh, I, I'm sure you have heard there are news about uh, the impending changing of smart meters in the Klang Valley after they successfully done it in Malacca uh, by TMB. Uh, our, our share of the portion is about 240,000 units of smart meters, which we are currently uh, still ongoing or supply. will supply complete everything by June. So with this, we actually are becoming one out of the four supplier of uh, uh, TMB that is carrying ongoing supplying this energy meter and uh, completely tested and accepted by TMB. We have so far delivered about 163,000 units of uh, meters to TMB for use in Klang Valley. We are particularly proud about this one because smart meters help the utility to be better efficient managing the, uh, the network as well as to give information to consumer. And with this, uh, platform, we are able to offer this service to other utility in the region, for example, in Papua New Guinea, uh, Indonesia, Bali, as well as uh, Cambodia, maybe. So this actually opened up a door for us to do other bis other than uh, just big substation and transmission line work, but also go, go into the consumer service part, where we are able to give exact information to the utility about how people is using the electricity, uh, when, uh, and then whether they are stealing the electricity or not. Sorry, gentlemen. So next is the, uh, I like to show this because this is a mobile substation there which our engineers has successfully completed it through our JICA project, supply it to Iraq. And what is this? Uh, I don't know if everybody know or not. We actually put substation on a truck where they can uh, truck the substation to a specific location where they like to put it and then put the thing into service to serve the people in the community. And everybody understand Iraq is a war-torn area, very unstable. So they will bring the substation, truck it to the place they want, park it there, connect it up, and they can give supply to the village or the community. So of course, at the same time, they can unplug and drive it away when there's trouble in it. So we have actually completed this job sometime in December last year and delivered the products to Iraq in uh, January. And this is funded by Japanese fund called JICA. So we are very proud. We are able to secure the project to open tender, competing with all the MNC, win the job, design, and then finish the job and deliver on time for this. So we are now one of the few that has in the world that has got experience in terms of supplying mobile substation into any utility in the world. So uh, this one, uh, pre sorry, uh, is the substation that we completed in this project, Okvav. I'd like to show this because this project is actually, we win it in January 2020 and COVID come, it came and still COVID, but we finished the job in February uh, 2021. So this is a job in Cambodia that we won. We executed during COVID and then complete it before COVID go away. So actually salute to my guys. Uh, we actually commissioned it uh, in uh, February or early March, this substation. This substation is supplying to a gold mine in Cambodia. So there you go, gentlemen, you need power in order to mine. So that's why our service is required all around the region to give various kinds of uh, facility and uh, uh, convenience to the people executing and uh, delivering the job to the community. So other than that, uh, in Malaysia, uh, I'll like show a little bit. This is Junjong, uh, one of the key substations in the north where we'll handle 2,400 megawatt of uh, 
electricity transmitting to the north and bring it down from I, I Tawau uh, in uh, TMB. So this is a site that has got 500 kV uh, switch yard. And, uh, and this one we like to show because this is the first substation they managed to convince TMB that we use a precast construction method instead of a conventional method. And with this, we are able to save about 50% of the labor to use in the substation construction of a, a building and also all the different kinds of plywood and foam works that we use uh, in a conventional method is reduced tremendously and there's no plywood, almost zero use at the site. And so we are promoting sustainable uh, kind of construction also while we constructing the substation. So this is, we are very proud that we are the first one that is doing it in situ as site without using the standard kind of precast method uh, in the market and apply it to TMB. So, and then this job is quite a unique because this job has got substation and also transmission line. And various are all around the region, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are able to do the job, including sub, uh, with both substation and transmission line together in order to give solution to the utility in one stop uh, engineering solution, as well as execution when you include transmission line, substation, underground cable all together. And we are not uh, required to work with any other party that has got different skill. So this is one of the plus points as a system integrator of Pestec after going to into the industry for more than 20 years, right? So this is uh, another job in Kuala Lumpur. This is 275 kV underground cable in Kuala Lumpur uh, from Ampang to Prince Scott. Uh, hospital. If you can see the map, Jalan Enggang, Jalan Ampang, Jalan Yuta, Jalan Tun Raza, and Jalan Bukit Bintang. And when you look at that, 5.3 kilometer, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we execute this for two circuit of 275 kV underground cable. And you will see us working at night there, and then using the underground uh, HDD drill, uh, we call it high tension directional drill, uh, we go down as deep as 5.5 meter underground, gentlemen. So, so in, in that sense, uh, this skill is within our organization to be able to maneuver this underground five, up to 5.5 meter as required for uh, uh, delivering the job. So we are quite proud that we are doing it. And this is quite a major achievement for the group. So these are all the cables and this sub, see this job, we, uh, we work together with a Korean manufacturer called Taihan. We delivered all the cable into Kuala Lumpur already. Uh, okay, so MLT2. Okay, before I finish, uh, there's a client, uh, no, there's a shareholder who sent me a question just now, Mr. Chua, who asked me, uh, how do we handle this fluctuation of copper and stuff like that when we do our job? So if you can see all the pictures and all that, we most of the time we are not buying raw material like metal or copper directly, but we're buying complete product. So all these products are uh, uh, procured and negotiated as a complete product without subject to the fluctuation of uh, commodity so much. So once we have uh, secured it through a tender rate and put down the order, uh, the price is fixed throughout the whole contract. So this is most of the time, uh, the situation of our uh, supply based on our contract. So we do not affect so much on the commodity pricing fluctuation, except for the copper that we buy. But copper that we use for earning is only maybe about two, 3% of every contract. That's about it. So uh, other than substation and all that, I'd like to show this following few slides, uh, the MRT job that we are doing. So if you notice MRT1, uh, the electrical power system is done by a Japanese company, but MRT2, ladies and gentlemen, we are proud to say that it is all done by a Malaysian company, which is Pestec on the electrical system portion. So phase one, we have completed. Now we are doing phase two. And then with this completion, we will be one of the only, I think few or, or if not one, uh, the uh, Asian company that has got full experience of electrification for MRT2 project, which is so-called urban rail. 
right? We got this opportunity through acquisition of a company called Colas Real Sandiam Bahat, CRSE, and now executing it to Gamuda. Uh, hopefully we can complete it on time by November or October this year. All right, so this is the site where you can see the tunnel of the MRT. This is in Chan Saoling, 42 story down, 42, sorry, 42 meter underground. So we are laying cables, we are building substation underground uh, in this job, including the AC and DC portion of the job. So all this is gentlemen, executed by a local engineers working together with, uh, of course, support of Colas as our partners. Okay, these are just some of the pictures that we have. So with this completion, uh, hopefully before MRT3 come, we will be in a position to bid with a completed job reference. Anyway, we have completed phase one of the MRT2. Uh, hopefully this will give us a, 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 what they call an edge when we tender for MRT3 that is up and coming. All right, other kind of job of rail, other than underground cable kind of work for urban rail, we also are executing a contract for YTL for Southern Double Track, where our responsibility again is the electrical portion of the work including signaling for this job. So our work is a bit different from MRT because the cable right now is OCS, we call it overhead continuary system, where it is bare conductor instead of underground cable. Uh, just because this is 190 kilometer long, but MRT2 is just 52 kilometers. So we can use cable, which is more reliable, but 190 kilometer, if you want to use underground cable, very expensive. So that's why we got, we call it the main rail, which is long distance and it is overhead continuary system. So with this is also a know-how winning our group. They are able to deliver this, All right? So other than that, uh, recently we also win a job uh, in Kappa through Kappa Energy, uh, a 300 megawatt coal fire plant upgrade. So this is just to show a various kind of from A to Z in the electrical network that the best tech as a group has got know-how to execute it uh, in order to deliver different kinds of solution to the utility. So uh, other than uh, Malaysia, let's look at the region. Other than Cambodia, we're doing work in Papua New Guinea. So you can see actually the market for us is in the region, if not the whole world, because what we are doing is handling high voltage uh, uh, what they call it, electrical system, which is similar all around the world because it's physics. If it is 132 kV, physics of 132 kV in Papua New Guinea is same as physics for 132 kV in Malaysia. So with that, we can deliver our service all around the region where it is required when we want to build a network or a substation. So again, this job in Papua New Guinea include also the transmission line and the substation, both portion, and we are all doing it in-house for our own engineer in terms of design, execution, uh, and also commissioning. So again, this is Philippine. The same pictures you see, is oh, this is a 230 kilovolt substation. Again, the physics in Philippines, same as the physics in Malaysia. So that's why we can send our engineer, export our know-how, into executing it, uh, the job in Philippines. Um, many hours flight away, three hours maybe, uh, from Kuala Lumpur. Okay. So uh, this is just to show that uh, this is another job that we got from uh, Philippines, uh, a job to build a substation in Boroke Island. I don't know whether you're familiar with Philippines, but Boroke is a heaven of uh, white sand beaches. So uh, I hope I can fly very soon so I can go and have a look at the site where I can spend some time on the beach uh, near Boroke. So Boroke substation is also uh, something that we are doing in Philippines. So other than all these things that we are doing, we hope uh, it's clear uh, what area of service that PESTEC is doing. Uh, we are also, I also, all the time been getting questions about concern on our gearing ratio uh, from the public and also from the shareholders. If you, I just want to explain a little bit. If you look at our books as of last year, June 30, 2020, 
we have a borrowing of about 1.2 billion. And some of the people were telling, hey, you do job, but you didn't collect. Uh, is your customer not paying you? But ladies and gentlemen, out of the 1.2 billion, we have a so-called investment project, which I touched on earlier, a concession portion that we created since 2016. We have invested 715 million ringgit to a, in a concession project, which is an investment project, we call it. And all this investment project is uh, uh, having a repayment period, recurring income to the group of about between seven years to 25 years. So within our uh, so-called order book, inside our order book, we have right now about five concession. Three, we have completed COD uh, as of January, 2020. And we are collecting right now every month, 3 million US dollar directly from the utility. So you can see as of 2021 half year, we have pared down payment for the investment project, which reduced our debt of the investment project into 642 million. And why is it? Because these projects are ring fence. So the owing to the bank, because of the investment uh, we put in, is ring fence with the collection. So ladies and gentlemen, a big portion of our order, uh, of our borrowing, sorry, uh, is actually due to the investment project that we already uh, have a ring fence mechanism of paying down. So if you take out the one, actually our EPCC normal business borrowing is actually at about 470 million, which gives us only a gearing ratio of about 0 0.69. So that is a reason why our gearing ratio uh, is at a level of about 1.9, uh, 1.98 uh, as of end of 2020. So gain ratio as a half year, uh, first half year of 20, year 2021 is 1.64. And we are monitoring it so it doesn't go beyond 2.5, but we keep a cap at two. So uh, with that, uh, when you see the additional depth there, this is just uh, what they call that an indication. If we are going to hold on to another concession job, we can take on another 245 million as of uh, 31st Gen uh, December 2020, uh, and we are not go beyond two, our gearing ratio. Why we like to have a concession? Because in a concession business, we we'll have integrated income, basically both the EPCC and also the concession uh, margin. So that give us, give the group a, a better return during the construction and also during the uh, concession period that will create us recurring income. So while we are careful not to create, not to take on more and more debt, we also are looking very, very closely into uh, creating value for the, for the company in terms of having more and more concession that will give us recurring income. So that is a situation of uh, the books. But this, this slide is just showing that uh, the three COD project that we got, how much we are going to collect for the next just seven years. In, in fact, one of it, it goes all the way to 25 years uh, as from now. So for the next seven years, we will collect about 1.1 B. But in the ring fence mechanism, we are only paying our financer as about 400 million. So this created uh, quite a healthy cash flow for the group in terms of uh, collection. And with this, uh, we are able to now look at very closely, uh, again, a, a question by Mr. Chua uh, on the dividend. Uh, when is the forthcoming dividend? So with all these concession, uh, concession project that we have COD, now the group can really look at how are we going to reward the shareholder that have been staying with us uh, uh, in the years to come. But of course, we will also balance out because uh, the company is still in a growing phase. Uh, that's why we do not able to tell when and how we're going to give a dividend, but definitely we're going to start uh, the ball rolling again after we have stopped for about two, three years, which uh, is uh, evidence in the last quarter, uh, no, the last half year, as of 30 June, December 2020, 2020, we're given about one cent of a dividend out. So we hope we can give more in the years to come. All right. So other than the general uh, conventional works and all that, 
because of the, the nature of the work that we are in, uh, is actually directly, uh, what they call that, influenced or, or, or affected by the development of more and more power that we definitely use uh, in terms of urbanization and modernization. So sustainability development is definitely one of our main concern uh, as uh, when we do our day-to-day -day business. So a big portion of our effort right now is to go into finding solution to sustainably generate electricity for the use of the urban people and also the remote uh, people. So because more and more electricity will be used, how is it generated is the key, all right? So how are we doing it? There are a few efforts that we are doing right now. First, I want to share with you guys, uh, we call it the renewable-based microgrid system. And we have delivered this uh, to as a proof of concept and a show that we can do it in a, in a, in a orang asli kampong in Jalan Pahang Tapa, Batu 23. In this village, there's about 137 people uh, living in two, two, what do you call that, two group uh, of uh, houses. And our solution has to be clean, renewable. So how do we do it? Okay, so with the help of a company called Anapter from Germany, uh, which is experts in terms of energy management and also uh, hydrogen fuel cell technology, we are looking at delivering the solution using hydrogen. Why hydrogen? Because hydrogen is a uh, odorless, tasteless element and there's a lot in the universe. And when you burn hydrogen, it gives you clean energy because there's no carbon in H, right? So when you burn hydrogen, you will get only water. And because of that, we incorporate hydrogen in the solution for our microgrid, okay? So how does it work? We put solar, when the solar is generating uh, power, daytime, some of the energy will go into an electrolyzer where it will do electrolysis to break down the water and uh, create hydrogen. So when we, the hydrogen is created, it is stored in a tank, okay? When there's no sun for a day, when the uh, energy is depleted, depleted from the super capacitor that we deliver there, the hydrogen will be used in the fuel cell to generate electricity and create water back. So this is the basic principle of it where we have applied in our solution towards remote area where you don't have electrical grid yet, okay? So with that, uh, we assemble and we uh, ass manufacture this hydrogen fuel cell in our plant and deliver this to Tapa, uh, Batu Dupotiga for the Orang Asli. And they are able to get 24 seven electricity supply, uh, which they do not have for the last 20 years. So with this, we generate electricity uh, sustainably through the use of solar, uh, hydrogen fuel cell, and using water as fuel, and also super capacitor to replace the battery. Because battery is also not last long lasting and we have a problem into uh, what you call that, uh, handling the battery after its cell life. So, and you can see in the, re in the far end there in the picture, there's also a disc that you can see because we put in remote monitoring for our microgrid. So remotely right now, actually from our laptop, I can see whether the system is working or not in Tapa for the Orang Asli village. So with this, we are able to deliver solution to the people who stay in remote area who do not have electric grid service. And then it is gonna save money for the utility so, so, so that they do not have to invest in this social responsible project who bring grid all the way to all that 137 people uh, in Tapa, which take a long time for any utility to do because of investment required. So, and with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to say we have currently, we have three projects in hand, uh, which is one 100 kilowatt hour microgrid uh, solution for a village in, uh, this is actually New Island project. This is in Papua New Guinea, I've got to put it there. And this is a village of 24 houses with one kilometer radius. And our responsibility 
including replacing the gen diesel genset and then install a small distribution network for the 24 houses to distribute power to all the houses. And the project cost is about 1.8 million for them. And then we also have another one that is supplying a 150 kilowatt hour uh, system microgrid to a hospital in the same area. Okay, and this is a project cost of about 2.4 million for the hospital. But ladies and gentlemen, this too is very minimum if you compare to bringing the grid, uh, submarine cable and all that for the main island, go to the new island uh, in uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, so that they will have continuous power supply instead of having to wait for diesel genset to transport from the main island to their village. So, and then at home, somewhere near here is Cebu, Sarawak. We are also executing a project uh, for a long house with 20 pin two, inclusive of a distribution network set up with smart meter for each of the houses. And this project cost is about 1.3 million. So Pestec is now uh, engaging into a business of creating sustainable generation of energy and to service remote area as a contribution to delay the requirement of the grid in order to improve the life and the lifestyle of the people in the remote area. So with that, we are very proud to say we have contributed in the supply of electricity for these people who live in a remote area where there's no grid, right? And other than that, the small grid, we are actually also having know-how to build a, a large-scale solar. And right now we are building one in, in Cambodia for 20 megawatt uh, solar plant, which is owned by our own uh, group, which we own 94% of the solar farm. Uh, we, we were at a rate of about 7.6 cent US per kilowatt hour. So this one, uh, we again are doing our own EPCC, designing the solar farm, the layout, uh, and also the interconnection, which is our expertise. And there is a six kilometer, 22 kV line in order to connect the solar farm to the grid, to EDC, which is our customer anyway. And then, uh, Earthwo is currently ongoing and actually the first batch of solar panel already there. Uh, we target to commission this place by November 2021, right? And again, we are doing our own EPCC, uh, precast method of construction again, so that we build the, the foundation and the required, uh, what they call that, structure as on a precast method and then lay out all the uh, solar panel modularly. And we put in the containerized solution of the substation using dry transformer so that there's no oil in the uh, solar farm. And we're gonna put in our microgrid as well so that this solar farm is really green. It doesn't have any connection to the grid uh, that is taking power for its own use. The, the only uh, thing that is going to the grid is the generated solar farm, a uh, solar energy. So it's really a green solar farm. Uh, that we are creating. So our approach towards renewable energy is trying to continue to provide solution to power up the remote community and industry in a sustainable way through our project that hopefully will sustain the environment. So indeed, we are improving quality of life through a sustainable business activity, uh, which is our mission. And at the same time, we are gonna to continue to promote this to the industry owner uh, to build RE on a BOT basis. So to solve the issue of technology anxiety and uh, maybe the cost of maintenance and worry about maintenance. So ours, we hope we can turn more industry into sustainable industry and also farmers into becoming a sustainable farming. And then we will continue to explore collaboration with technology partner, which recently uh, through our listing of Cambodia, we have collaborated a company from Germany called MR who has got technology to uh, improve quality of uh, so-called harmonics in a renewable energy farm, as well as uh, so-called uh, high power EV charging station, uh, which I'll go into it after a short while, All right? So here it comes, we go, let, let, let me into the, our talking about a little bit about our EV charging initiative. Why are we going into EV charging? Uh, at this point of time, which is still very, uh, at the beginning stage in Malaysia, right? 
So ladies and gentlemen, if you look at this chart here, the energy consumption in Malaysia, right? Uh, if you look at 100%, 37% of energy consumption is due to power station. Industrial, 17%. Transportation system, 26%. Of course, you get residential and then uh, some of this as non-energy user. So out of this 26, out of this distribution of energy consumption, the, the contribution to CO2 emission, the biggest portion is energy, which is power plant, 54%. Transportation contribute 25% of the CO2 emission. So, and if you look at transportation system, if you look at transportation system in 2015, the whole transportation system, remember that CO2 is 25%. Inside that 25%, 47% contribution is from car and petrol. So ladies and gentlemen, if they are, you are out there, hear me out here. If you, it is a low hanging fruit to move from petrol car into EV car, because that we will help ourselves by reducing CO2 emission into our environment that we breathe. So let's, let's work together to move away from till pipe exhaust uh, CO2 and leave the CO2 to the power plant first as a first step. So with that, uh, we go into what they call it working towards promoting the use of EV charging. And um, I would like to share with you this uh, what I call it, roadmap. We started with ability to deliver a 3.7 kilowatt uh, charging station. What's the concept? It means if a normal car, let's say, uh, uh, what do you call that, uh, Nissan Leaf or something like that, this will take about seven, eight hours to charge full. And of course, the higher power is it, the shorter it takes to charge. So we are now able to do seven kilowatt and also have option for 22 kilowatt. But recently we have delivered, we have tested our system that is 150 kilowatt, which is able to charge a Tesla in about 30, 45 minutes. So the whole roadmap of uh, EV charging is uh, already matured in the company, ready to roll out. And also we have put up uh, apps that we can allow consumer to download and then book a charging place and also to start, start charge, stop charge anytime that you want. Uh, as long as you see a charging point that is uh, able to be scanned through a QR code. So we are working with TMB as well as Park Easy right now. We hope there's more and more EV car take up so that in a way contribute to reduction of CO2 emission in the city. So this is a, a video that shows that we have tested this with Tesla. I don't know whether you can run. Let me try and do this thing. Okay. All right. So we have done this for 150 kilowatt charging point and plugging into a Tesla that we can be charging it, uh, working together with EMB. So we hope there's more and more charging point that we can work and, and give the, what do you call it, range anxiety reduced for the people who own an EV car so that we can play a part in the environment. All right. So with all that behind me, um, Let's talk a little bit about prospects. Uh, as of January, actually we do it up to January this one. As of January 2021, our order book in hand is 2.2 billion. In fact, we can see, foresee this year, uh, this financial year 2021, maybe one of the best years so far of the new contract that we're able to secure. And as of January 2021, uh, we are already 37% uh, more than the last half year. So we are very positive in the so-called new order intake uh, in the year 2021. Uh, our, our tender book, major tender book, ladies and gentlemen, as of 31st January is at 2.2 billion. So what is driving all this is because we are in the region of fast growing, the fifth economy in the world, Southeast Asia, where a lot of uh, energy infrastructure is still need to be continued to be built. And uh, we have a, a market size of about 20, 30 billion US dollar a year, which we are currently only about one or 2% based on our turnover yearly of close to about two, 300 million US dollar. So, 
as of TMB, of course, recently we see a bit of hype in the activity of TMB, but it's still slow compared to the region. So we have tendered a few in TMB. Hopefully it can be concluded uh, within this financial year. But there's also other part of the world, like Papua New Guinea, there's a solar farm, 11 megawatts. So we are targeting all around the region, looking at all around the region, not just in Malaysia itself, because we have become active and able to deliver our job all around the region. So there's an 11 megawatt solar farm that we're looking at in Papua New Guinea and also some substation. And Cambodia, of course, Cambodia is a bus, uh, is, is, is hot, it's very fast growing. And uh, the electricity requirement is growing at a pace of about 20 to 30% a year. And look at the number of kilometers of transmission line that's required in, Papua, uh, in Cambodia. 230 kV, you need 394 kilometer of uh, transmission line all the way to just from now to 2025, okay? And also uh, power, uh, solar farm. There is a 40 megawatt additional uh, solar PV that is called by EDC recently, which we also participated, where the land is provided by the government with one US dollar leasing and the bidder is supposed to bid in order to construct the solar farm and asking for a price. So it's a 40 megawatt uh, plant uh, with a 52 megawatt install capacity. So we have tendered this. Uh, don't ask me how much I tendered because this is confidential, it's still in valuation stage. So what I'm trying to say is the opportunity all around the region, uh, as far as solar and renewable energy is concerned as well. Philippines, we are there since uh, 2014. No, sorry, 2017. So, so far in Philippines, we are very active. I'll show you what we have there. But these are the project lists from 2020 to 2040. So there's definitely a lot of projects in Philippines and they are rolling out more because after COVID, the government is pushing out more and more projects so that it can kickstart the economy internally. Uh, before the private sector take over. So because Tivoli is trying to build a backbone of the transmission system all the way from Luzon to Visaya to Mindanao Island, right? So these are all the list of substation or uh, things that they're going to build in Philippines. Right now, uh, Pesta as a company, we are actually executing four projects in Philippines, uh, totaling at a value of around equivalent 300 million uh, ringgit. So definitely we have already set our foot in Philippines and recurring contract is happening uh, every now and then from Philippines. All right. Other than all the transmission line and substation, I want to share a little bit on the rail. So as our experience in rail electrification is built up, uh, consisting of MLT2 kind urban rail and also uh, main rail kind of uh, project, long distance rail, we are now able to tender all around the region. The main one right now uh, is uh, the North-South Railway project for Philippines, for Malolos to Tutuban, for 37 kilometer uh, project. We will join together with Hitachi. Uh, it's a JICA funded project. So there's also a Taiwan uh, opportunity and also a Bangkok opportunity called an Orange Line. We have completed Red Line in Bangkok. So now we are tendering for Orange Line. So. Uh, we are hoping real electrification will be our upside contributor, which will bring us from 1 billion company revenue into 2 billion in about three, four years to come. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, that's about it that I have uh, in terms of sharing of the current uh, project and also some prospect of the company and outlook. So uh, uh, I will stop here, but if you follow us, you get Instagram and Facebook, you will see our, our, our activity and progress uh, up to date. So uh, pass it back to you, Sean. Thank you so much, Mr. Paul, for your very insightful sharing about right. Pestech. I think we have learned a great deal about Pestech business, uh, the business model and also the future prospects. So it appears that the future prospect remains very, very bright for the next few years to come. So if any questions to ask uh, the group CEO of Pastech International, uh, Berhad, please type in the Q&A box uh, 
not the chat box so that we can easily manage your questions. So uh, let me repeat that. If you have any question to ask uh, the managing director, come group CEO of Pastag, please write in the Q&A box, not the chat box, so we can easily manage your question. Of course, for our friends who are tuning in from YouTube, you can ask in the YouTube uh, live chat, then we will pick a few questions there. All right, so let me go through the questions. We already have over 30 questions right now on the panel, but of course, due to time constraint, we may not be able to answer all of them. So let me just uh, uh, quickly go through. Now, I see that there are a few questions on asking about uh, who are uh, your, your closest competitors in the area of the business that you, you do. All right, uh, Sean. Uh, okay, our closest competitor. I think uh, we see quite a lot of system integrator uh, from MNC uh, from the region. So we meet people from uh, uh, Europe uh, and also these uh, Japanese and uh, from uh, uh, Korea and uh, so uh, and also of course uh, China. So they are system integrator. Uh, that is also doing the building infrastructure for utility. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Paul. Yeah. Okay, so next question is, while the net profit are expanding, uh, however, the percentage of net profit attributable to the owners have reduced. Uh, can, can you give us an indication of the percentage that will be shared with the non-controlling shareholders? That is by Mr. KK Chua. Uh, okay, I mean, uh, it depends on the, uh, what they call it, phase of the execution of the project. Right now, we are actually uh, only have two projects that we have a non-controlling interest sharing. One is the uh, deep diamond power project that is already completed COD, which is uh, going through a constant collection of payment right now, which is a fixed 40% uh, of that project only. And the new one that we have is uh, under execution, which is the OD, uh, Siamret area project. Uh, which we own 70%. So we only have these two that we are sharing with uh, non-controlling guys. So, but there's no exactly the percentage of uh, how much from our revenue, but it depends on the uh, execution phase of that Siamret project that will be fluctuating. Mm, okay. Yeah. Uh, we also have a question from YouTube. Uh, Yong Yo, who want to ask like for solar EPCC, is mm. Pet Stack able to compete with the local solar players? Well, EPCC for solar uh, is part of our EPCC uh, business segment, which we will put. And our normal so-called uh, required uh, maintain at the uh, margin that we want is 9 to 11%. So of course, we will quote to the people who won the LLS in Malaysia. But really, uh, our EPCC team is executing project all around the region. So there's no one project that we really must get. But every project that we get, we hope we uh, bring us a net profit of about 9 to 11%. Sean. Mm, okay. Um, the next question is by Rem Sema. What is your cost in producing one smart meter and how does the green energy impact to your business? Green energy impact to my business? Well, uh, the, the profit margin uh, of, a, of the group, we try to uh, set an average of about 9 to 11%. So they will apply to everything that we do uh, on an average basis. Uh, green energy is actually get no impact to our project. In fact, we, we are very happy if we go greener and greener because of the know-how and the activity that we are uh, engaging in right now. So we are able to participate in uh, renewable energy of solar form and we are going into waste to energy. So in fact, uh, more and more, if there is more and more uh, renewable energy sources, we are able to expand our service 
more and more towards uh, building the whole power plant because the thermal power plant and gas power plant are more complex and more, uh, what do you call it? Uh, what's the word for it? And more niche in terms of people who are able to market it that they can do it on their own. So if renewable energy sources increase more and more, it's actually a plus point for us uh, in terms of able to execute uh, our service to various customers more because the renewable energy plants are mostly modular and are mostly uh, comparatively easier to build compared to a process plant that involves burning of coal or gas power plants, steam turbine and stuff like that. Mm, okay. Um, the next question is by William Thor. Um, Pastec invested uh, close to a 4 million US dollar for 90% stake in a solar farm at Bavet, Cambodia. Yeah. So he has a few questions. Uh. Number wow. one, how much is needed to invest to commission the solar farm? Is the cost inclusive of the land cost? So that's question number one. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we have invested... Uh, we have uh, it, at the beginning we, we won the EPC portion and then uh, we got into opportunity where the uh, owner is wanted to divest his interest so we offered a 4 million US dollar so uh, he's willing to let go 94% of the share while still maintaining 6% as a friendly party so we took on the, uh, the opportunity and uh, uh, now we own 94% of the job. So to execute the job, uh, inclusive of the land cost, is about 21 million uh, during the construction period. And the maintenance phase is about 3, three to 4 million US dollar, inclusive uh, of the 20 years maintenance. So total cost of the project is about 24 million to the EPC guy with o &M. So that is the, uh, our solar farm. Mm, okay. Now the next the next question from him is like, what is the progress to date, and what kind of return do you expect? Well, uh, our our COD is uh, currently at uh, November twenty uh, October twenty twenty one. Sorry. So if uh, COVID situation allowed, uh, we may not need extension. But of course, COVID is uh, enemy that we cannot see. So uh, we are trying to still maintain the date. So uh, the IRR for the project is about 12 at the moment uh, because of the rate that the uh, Cambodian government is giving. So we are able to achieve about 12% IRR. Mm. All right. So the, I think our government is also very uh, focused on the, the renewable energy right now. So the next question is, did PASTEC bid for LSS4? If not, uh, why? <laughs> okay, no, we didn't bid for LLS4 because at the moment, uh, the result of the LLS3 uh, makes us feel that uh, with the same amount of investment as a company, we will have to look for opportunity elsewhere to maintain our margin of 9 to 11%. So we didn't bid for LLS4 as a developer, but we definitely are quoting as an EPC uh, also for LLS4. Uh, of course, uh, it's up to the developer who want it, whether they will uh, use us with is reliable and able to give them a, a what they call it, uh, a secured order, a, a secured supply and system uh, compared to other, they will quote them. But in the whole region, uh, Sean, we have about 20 to 30 billion market available for us. So EPCC to build solar is a part of the EPCC portion of the work. So there's no uh, definite project that we must win, but we will quote, of course, whenever there's opportunity. Mm, okay. Um, yeah. Mr. Paul, would you enlighten us on the risk of any change in the governments for your long-term concessions? Uh? That is asked by Eric Kong. Okay, for our concession business, of course, uh, we have 25 years. We have one 25 years. The other one is seven years. And we have one four years. And uh, our Siam Red project is 10 years. So all these projects we have, uh, when we secure the financing, we do have a requirement to purchase 
project uh, ERI project political risk insurance sorry a uh, political risk insurance uh, that will cover and uh, recover our costs uh, in invested so this is taken care by the insurance uh, of course so far we have been consistently receiving over uh, three four years already uh, every month about three million right now we are collecting from Cambodia utility. Mm, okay. Yeah. Uh, could you also tell us, uh, just now we see that you have, uh, you know, uh, many different projects, uh, not only domestically, but also regionally. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So uh, could you tell us like how many percent of Pestex uh, revenue is from local and how many percents are from overseas? Okay, right now uh, we have about 60, 40 in terms of the order book, 60% overseas, 40% local. The 40% local, uh, mostly because of a real electrification job at Multi 2 and Southern Double Track. Uh, of course, we do have TMB contract and uh, Strava Energy contract as well. Mm, okay. So the next question is like, may, yep. may I know after the completion of these substations, uh, does mm. it mean that there will be further almost perpetual maintenance contracts. Now, is it fair to assume that it will be about 10 to 20% of total capital costs? Uh, what do you mean? So, okay, on a substation when we build, if we don't own the concession, we are EPC contractor. So when we finish it, the utility will actually take over the maintenance. So, but for concession project, for example, our Krache to uh, Kampung Cham project, we are responsible for the o &M. So that part, we are doing the uh, operation and maintenance as well. But for the EPCC project, we do not, we are not involved in the maintenance project. Utility mostly uh, do it on their own and uh, ask for service whenever there's a required uh, specialized uh, knowledge required in terms of the uh, system that we deliver. Mm, okay, there's also a question from YouTube who want to ask uh, Mr. Paul mm. that uh, do you plan to do or undertake private placement or rights issue to improve your company's gearing? Uh, not at the moment because like I said, the gearing is actually uh, normal, normal business operation gearing is about 0 0.69 right now. So uh, not a level of concern because the other part are all ring fence which actually uh, in terms of uh, cost to the company is actually costed and uh, manageable. So we are not looking at right issue or placement uh, to what they call that, improve anything or any of our gearing because we are actually at about 0 0.69 if we take out all the ring fence kind of uh, concession business. Mm, yeah, very good to hear that. Yeah. Uh, so from uh, another question from YouTube, from Brian Choi is that for EV charger segment uh, that you just uh, presented, uh, when do you expect to have contribution to the company? If yes, how much will it be? Well, right now, uh, in the Klang Valley, we have about 18 EV charging stations where we do uh, some of the revenue sharing, some of it we supply the hardware. So, of course, right now, uh, EV car in Malaysia is still uh, very, very what do you call this, uh, infant stage. So uh, we are hoping to contribute in terms of uh, uh, promoting it and educate it that this is the way to go and it's a low hanging fruit to reduce CO2 emission in the city where we breathe the air. And uh, so we will continue to convince the uh, authority and also the uh, maybe the mall owner to put in more EV charging uh, point facility uh, so that it will go hand in hand when there's more and more EV car on the road which is definitely the trend in the world because uh, if I, I remember correctly by the year 2030 or 2035 um, the European car maker no longer will produce uh, petrol car fossil fuel car so by then uh, definitely, if you don't want to buy go EV, you also have to buy EV. Uh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, of course, we also have our friend here, Kang Sien, uh, asking this question from Zoom. Uh, 
Uh, the, the US is going to launch 500,000 EV charging stations by 2030. So is Pastec uh, having a plan to enter into the US market? Well, uh, it takes 24 hours to fly there. So I think it will be a bit far-fetched. But uh, around the region here, we got plenty of opportunity for us to grow our business. I don't think in the near future, we will go to US Mm, okay. Yep. Because I don't know if you notice the slide I have. Uh, I think in the year 20, 2030, there will be about 40 million vehicles in Southeast Asia. So there's more than enough cars to serve here. So definitely we will need quite a lot of EV charging point, maybe in the five years to 10 years to come. Mm, okay. Yeah. Uh, the next okay. question is by Terry, who would like to ask, like, uh, would you guide us on your KPEX expectation ahead, uh, probably in financial year 2022? Well, uh, our work actually doesn't require us to have cap a lot of CapEx. We actually are basically built on infrastructure. So we are EPCC contractor, except we have investment when we have a, a so-called concession project where we invest to build the asset and when we collect over a period of time, like an IPP, we call it an IPT, independent power transmitter. So CapEx is not a big equation in our works. Uh, so we do not require CapEx to grow our business, but just normal uh, administrative CapEx. So there's no big CapEx required. Mm, okay. Um, for the concession project, mm. what is your targeted EIRR that is asked by YH Hoon? Targeted. So far, all our concession project, uh, we had about high teams. All right. Mm. So, of course, it's different project by project. Mm, yeah. So, the follow-up questions by him is that, uh, are the concession projects in Cambodia government guarantee? Uh, it uh, the, the first project that we did, uh, Kampung Cham Krache, uh, there's no government guarantee. Uh, subsequently, the other project all have it, having it. Mm, okay, yeah. that's great. Yeah. Uh, Peter Ling would like to ask, like, for transmission lines, mm. how many years do you require to do maintenance after you complete the project? Wow. Uh, okay, like I said, uh, transmission line, for example, the our concession project, we have 25 years uh, responsibility to maintain it. Actually, a transmission line after you build, it can last 40 years or 50 years. Uh, it is built to last for 40 years. So along the line, the utility will always maintain it in terms of cutting the trees, right? making sure that uh, there's no uh, what they call a conductor all around. Uh, the transmission line and things like that. Mm, okay. Yep. Uh, let me see the next question. Does EV charging require upgrade of power grid? EV charging require upgrade of power grid? No, uh, you don't require upgrade of power grid, but it's a solution. Uh, that you need to put in uh, so that it doesn't disturb the grid. Uh, that is the answer, I guess. When you have a 22 kilowatt, it doesn't matter. But when you have a 300 kilowatt charging station where you can charge a car in about 10, 20 minutes from zero to 80%, uh, then you need to put a solution in that it will not disturb the grid when the car is charging. So that will not affect the grid. Mm. Yeah. So Raymond would like to ask, what are the challenges faced by the company and also the completion of pricing? Sorry, I think uh, there's a typo, so let me try to understand. I think it's competition. So the question is, what are the challenges faced by the company and also the competition of pricing of your products with similar industry players? Well, uh, I said in our industry, uh, we are working in the... In a, we are working in the industry that is uh, 
a lot of a lot of uh, what they call that demand, right? In the whole region per year, we are looking at about twenty to thirty billion US dollar investment per year. So, in fact, our order major tender book. Uh, every quarter when we report our major tender book is in the region of around at least 1 to 1.5 billion. So, in, so our key take in this, uh, based on our know-how and all that, is to maintain our margin, net margin of about 9 to 11%. So, so far, we are only looking at about less than 1 to 2% of available market. So definitely, there's always another substation or transmission line to build. And then our challenge is to how to expand uh, the service that we can provide to our client. So that's why we're going into uh, real electrification as well, so that we can have a broader uh, market access that we can have without must win any project that we tender. So this has been our business model so far, Sean. Mm, okay. So uh, I also see a f- uh, many questions on the future prospect. Like uh, Mr. Paul, would you be able to like uh, guide us on what is your expected compound annual growth rate of the company for the next five years? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's hard to say, right? I mean, beyond five years or something. Right? Now, now we hope is uh, uh, everybody got vaccinated and uh, COVID is behind us. So we are, ta- we are hoping in the year 2022, we are able to achieve our 1B revenue first as our first target. Uh, year 2021, is our year end is coming soon, which is June uh, 2021. So we may have a challenge to achieve our long-term target of 1B because of the slowest, slowness, not stop completely, but slowness in the project in Malaysia and uh, in the region pocket, uh, what they call that, uh, hindrance here and there in Philippines and Cambodia because of COVID cases. So revenue churning has become a challenge as well uh, this financial year. But we are looking at closing at maybe at around 800 or close to 900 million, but not achieving our 1B. So we are hoping in the near future, 2022, year 2022, we are able to achieve 1B turnover with all everybody got vaccinated. So ladies and gentlemen, please get yourself registered in my Sajatra so everybody can get vaccinated. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice reminder for all of us here. Yeah. The, the next question is, uh, just now, uh, Mr. Paul, you mentioned about the unrealized Forex loss of about 15 million. So the question is, uh, has it been uh, computed in the earnings per share? Is the earning per share excluded the forex loss? Uh, excluded? No, it's included. Of course, it, it's included in our report. So we are reporting a lower uh, earning per share, earning per share, because of the unrealized loss that we have to report based on the accounting standard. Uh, mm-hmm. It's all the paper loss. Uh, what I'm trying to explain just now in our slide, uh, because of the US dollar ups and down. But of course. Uh, during January to March, US dollar did recover a bit. So a set will maybe contribute realize, unrealized gain lightly instead of unrealized loss. Mm, because mm. it fluctuates every quarter, depends on the situation of the uh, US dollar exchange rate against ringgit because we are reporting in ringgit. So it's actually a uh, uh, so called a paper loss uh, if we have not really collected it. But because we do have a foreseeable fixed schedule of payment in all these US dollar collection by a utility company. So we are able to do our planning and hedging. So we have been getting realized gain most of the time. Mm, That's great. Uh, Now, uh, Pasta has done many uh, projects in, uh, in the region, in many different countries. So uh, could you enlighten us? Like, do you have any collection issues with all the projects in various countries? And if yes, then what? Uh, how would that impact the cash flow? Well, we are a bit lucky. All our counterparties are statutory body or big conglomerate. Uh, for example, real electrification. Our client are Gamuda, uh, and then the Southern Double Track is YTL. The rest of the transmission line and substation are all utilities. 
So our counterparty risk is actually minimal. Uh, and then, uh, for example, in Philippines, we do get a letter of credit. And other than that, our project are funded by ADB, JICA. So all these are construction development bank, uh, which is uh, very low risk in terms of uh, collection. So, so far, on our history of doing business, we have not got any bad debt yet. Fantastic. <laughs> so Kok Yong would like to ask, on EV charge, uh, charging station, Yep. Uh, does Pastec target only Malaysia market? Or you also look at end-to-end -end, uh, green energy provider like from renewable energy to charging station? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, we are actually trying to build uh, EV charging station using renewable energy only whenever that is possible. Uh, and of course, if you ask me if it's only for Malaysia market, uh, our plan right now is hopefully we can do something sizable in Malaysia before we go to other country because actually really we are a company based in Malaysia. If people ask us, have you done, how big have you done in Malaysia before you go to Cambodia to do EV charging? We actually say not yet. Uh, we hope you give us the first break and it's not so nice. Uh. So of course we are able to uh, what we call it, offer the service all around the region. Like I said, physics are all the same. Electricity, you charge a car, it's all the same. So we are able to do it, but of course we like to do it at home first before we go out of Malaysia. Mm. Uh, there are also a few questions on asking you to estimate what are the chances of winning the, the tender like in Cambodia projects also or in domestically uh, oh. domestic projects. Oh, our tender hit rate is about 20% right now. Uh, of course, it depends on project by project. But like I said, uh, the industry that we are in, because it's electric city and building network for the utility. So we are the people behind you that make sure you can switch on the light, like the title of your uh, presentation tonight. So, and uh, demand for that service is definitely very high because nobody like it if there's no electricity, especially at night. So utility will continue to build and ensure a reliable and secure network for each of their country. So that's why there will be continuous investment into uh, upgrades or even new uh, requirement. Because if you don't build and maintain it, electricity network will fail by itself uh, because you are using it and uh, it's just a mathematical solution. They will have no solution. Then uh, the whole network will fail and collapse just on its own. So that is the danger if you not continue to invest in the electricity. Mm, okay. Yeah. Um, Mr. Paul, do you think that there's a high possibility that PASTEC will return to the earning per share of $0.04 cent per quarter or about 20 million in financial year 2022. 20 million? Uh, I, okay, I'm not sure uh, the figures, how it comes out, but our target, like I said, is always a net, a net earning percentage of 9 to 11%. So if we are doing at about uh, 800 million, uh, 700 million to 800 million, so we will be hoping to have a profit after tax of about 60 to 70 million ringgit. Mm, okay. Now, Jit Yen would like to ask, like, uh, are you happy with Pastec share price right now? <laughs> do you have any uh -huh. idea, any proposal oh. to do share buyback? <laughs> well, uh, no, I mean, uh, we uh, when we do share buyback, we are not basing on whether we are happy or not happy, but because uh, we are uh, having a need to have some treasury share so that we can reward our staff. So we will buy share, do share buyback when there is a need. Uh, but of course, if you ask me share price happy or not happy, I think we hope share price doesn't affect our business and our attitude towards business. Mm, okay, very, very nice answer. Um, <laughs> now, okay, since you also have a big, I mean, you have a lot of businesses in uh, Cambodia. So the next question is, how do you see the Vietnamese market? Do you have any plan oh, yeah. to enter into the market? Well, actually, we have set up a company uh, in Vietnam called, called what? Pested Vietnam? Pested Vietnam Limited. We actually have a company we set up like a year ago. 
a year or two ago. So we started to look at it only at the year 2019 like that. So very frank, honestly, uh, we are a bit late to go into Vietnam uh, market. But definitely there's opportunity that uh, we cannot turn our way, turn our back uh, without looking at it. So we are starting now to look at Vietnam uh, in terms of more towards uh, services to the power plant and more niche uh, other than just transmission line and substation, which we are a bit late because there's a lot of players in it that we don't want, we don't need to go and uh, uh, put a leg again. But we want to give our service that is not uh, yet uh, common, which is still depends on other MNC, like power plant uh, upgrades and uh, automation, even real electrification, things like that. And solar, solar rooftop as well. There's a few malls in uh, Vietnam that is looking for solar rooftop that are requiring a different kind of approach. For example, build, maintenance and transfer uh, other than just uh, uh, IPP agreement. Mm, okay. Yep. Uh, Fahan would like to ask, like, how is the microgrid prospect in the future? Well, we are very excited about microgrid and I feel that that gel very well into uh, what we want to do in terms of growing uh, the electricity, meeting the electricity demand. Uh, because we feel microgrid is a solution to give supply to the remote villages, which is in Malaysia context, is still a lot in Sabah and Sarawak, not so much in Peninsula, except for the Orang Asli village where we have done in Tapa and also still around a few Orang Aziz village in Pera and Pahang state. Uh, so microgrid is a solution that will be able to give power supply and improve the quality of life of these remote villages where they do not have uh, stable and constant electricity supply. And there is plenty of opportunity uh, in country like in Cambodia, Papua New Guinea and Laos and before February this year in Myanmar. So Myanmar, we just had to wait and see, but in Myanmar, actually there's a lot of villages, thousands of villages that's without the grid. So microgrid, if you ask me, is going to be a very exciting space that uh, we are definitely looking at it very, very, uh, what do you call it, actively. Uh, because we are able to deliver this solution in modular basis in container system. Uh, and this is what we also are doing for Sarawak government, uh, working together with Sarawak Energy, if they can uh, ex expand it for the use of all the remote longhouses villages, they will really solve the problem of uh, not able to give constant supply to the longhouses in Sarawak. That's great. Yep. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Paul Lim, for uh, giving us a very wonderful presentation of Pastec International Berhad. So we are very excited about the company's uh, prospect going forward and hopefully we can see that Pastec reaching 1 billion revenue in the next uh, years to come. All right, so uh, thank you everybody for tuning in for this uh, session, live chat with Pastec. So uh, let me tell you more about what Gananga has for you by can trade so the next webinar we have is live chat with solar vest holdings berhad which is happening on the 15 april 2021 which is a thursday so 8 30 to about 10 p.m so the registration link we have just given you in the uh, chat box uh, please register for it so it is happening on next thursday which is one week from now so we'll hear from a uh, EPCC player, another EPCC player in the solar solar field, right? So, and uh, this is the uh, Kentrid webinar in April 2021. Not only uh, solar vest if happening on the 15th of April, we also have the head of Kananga Research coming to talk about start of a new cycle on the 27th of April, okay? Which is done by Mr. Ko Huat Sun. All right, so if you uh, haven't, if you really want to hear what Kananga Research has for you, uh, please also block your date for 27th of April, which is a Tuesday. So for those of you who have not had a Kananga trading account, uh, please fill up uh, this form 
at www.cantrade.com.my forward slash open dash account dash form so that uh, you can register your interest and Kenanga Investment Bank will arrange a friendly dealer representative to attend to your needs to open an account under CanTrade. So with that, thank you everybody for joining these sessions. You have just heard from Mr. Paul Lim, who is the Managing Director come Group CEO of Pastec International Berhad. Thank you so much for sharing with us the company background so that we understand your business, understand your business performance as well as what does future hold for uh, Pastec International Berhad. Thank you, Mr. Paul Lim. Thank you, Shan. Bye. Yeah, thanks everybody and uh, have a pleasant rest of the day.